Thank you, Candice. Thank you, Candice, and welcome everyone. So what's next after Kubernetes? Um, is that a uh, audacious question? Do we dare ask? Uh, you know, I think Kubernetes is such a, a massive force on um, many of us and, and has had a massive impact on the industry as a whole. Uh, do we dare ask? But I think if you're here, you're probably as curious as I am as, as to what is it next after Kubernetes. So in this talk, I'm going to uh, show you an example of something that, that we've been doing, my company, that is kind of next after Kubernetes. But I'll give you a hint. It's it's Kubernetes less. And it's, take that for what, what it means. And we'll get back to that. So before getting into some of more of the details, I think it's really important to position things. And I, I honestly kind of think of the where we're at today and where we have been for a few years is we're in the, the Kubernetes era. And, and I'm talking from the perspective of backend systems typically running in the cloud or you know some you know, highly virtualized environment. But you know, there's kind of we're in this epoch or era of the Kubernetes time. And I think we're well entrenched in that time right now. Kubernetes has been around for, for a while and uh, it, you know, it's highly adopted as it should be. So there's these three eras. You know, there's pre-Kubernetes, there's Kubernetes, and then there's post-Kubernetes. I'll be focusing on post-Kubernetes. But pre-Kubernetes is, you know, we're we're doing things without Kubernetes. We, we're doing that for, uh, I've been in the business for a long time, and we've been doing <clears throat> things that evolved at a certain pace um, for a long time before Kubernetes came around. But then, wow, when Kubernetes came, it was, uh, it was just, a fantastic um, thing for us to adopt, and, and many, many of us have, have, have adopted it. And then now we're starting to build on top of that, and uh, so that's where I think things are heading. So uh, to kind, of, and what I mean by many of much of this is that we're, we're kind of dealing with abstraction layers. So this visualization here, I just want to use this to to, to talk a little bit about some of the abstraction layers. And the, just the concept of of, of, the, of the abstracting things away uh, as time goes on. So there's you know like six layers here, and I've I've just added some la labels. Uh, these are just arbitrary labels that I you know I picked. Um, that we could label this many many different ways, but just I just wanted to kind of go through the gauntlet of some of the the layers of um, infrastructure and technology that we depend on to run our systems and the abstraction layers that uh, kind of um, intersect as we go up the, up the stack here. Starting at the bottom, you know, there's the hardware and you know, just where we do computing, the actual physical devices that we use to do computing. When I started, you know, <laughs> I've been around a bit. Um, that's what, it, what we use, we use the physical hardware. But then along came virtualization and it was great. It was a, it was a, a, a great, abstraction layer uh, and it was a kind of a what I'll call a hard abstraction layer meaning that when we were allocated my teams that I worked on you know, or you, if you're using it as well when we're allocated uh, virtual systems we had no idea what the actual physical devices that these virtualized servers and, and virtualized devices were running on and we didn't really care so there was this kind of hard abstraction layer that, okay, we lived in the virtual environment and, and we were quite happy with that. Now, stepping way up to Kubernetes, that changed the, the game again, big jump in abstraction. And again, it's a, it's a hard abstraction layer where we run our applications in a Kubernetes environment. It gives us all the wonderful things and capabilities and, and you know features that come along with Kubernetes vastly superior to say just a you know what we had prior to kubernetes and it's a hard abstraction layer you know, we're quite happy to be there we, we we understand how to use kubernetes to run our applications and we're good with that now of course people are some people are having to deal with the uh, the inner workings you know kind of what what's in the black box uh, of the of the kubernetes environment but there's a clean kind of separation between those that are using what's on top versus those that are maintaining what, what's within. And then stepping up another layer, containers. And 
I know Kubernetes is really there to kind of manage containers is one way to look at it. And containers, I think, preceded Kubernetes, um, you know, to a certain extent. But it, it's just kind of enough uh, for the sake of this discussion. It's another layer of abstraction. You know, the containers nicely embraces the application code and shelters it from the outside world. It, it gives us this, you know, the application, this facade of this, these are the libraries that's using, this is the flavor of to say, you know, of the operating system that we're using, those types of things. So it, it isolates our application code. Stepping up another la layer, we've got services. And by services, what I mean are, are things like databases and message brokers, you know, um, and uh, security and say single sign on. And there's just, you know, tons and tons of different services that different applications depend on in order to you know, actually be completely functional. And then finally, the top layer is uh, the application layer. Now, what Kubernetes did is, like I said, it's a hard abstraction layer that we, we really don't uh, need to deal with what's below that abstraction layer, the vast majority of people that is, that is using Kubernetes. And those layers are still there, so this is the Kind of the the less thing is virtual system less. It's hardware less. It's, even though you know it's serverless in a way um, because the the, the servers are uh, abstracted away from the users, uh, especially the development teams. And this is you know my background. Um, the people that are trying to get things running within the Kubernetes environment. What's next, though, I think, is really taking another big jump, and this is abstracting away even more complexity because one of the phenomenons that has happened, I think recently, especially like with, with DevOps and, and so on is that, um, and trimming things down and you know making things e easier to a certain extent, a lot of responsibility for dealing with the, uh, the infrastructure that was left, even though it's great abstraction with the Kubernetes and these services was fell on the, uh, the development teams. And we're kind of drowning in complexity is, is one way that, um, that one way to think about it. And that we have to figure out, okay, what database are we gonna use? What message broker are we use? What, how are we gonna tweak this? How are we gonna run, you know, how are we gonna use Kubernetes? How are we gonna do all these different things? And then by the way, oh yeah, we gotta write the application. We gotta implement the features that the business and the users are asking for. So a lot of our time in development teams is spent not just cranking out features that matter to your users, matter to the business, but also dealing with you know, the environment that the application is going to run in. This next evolutionary jump, I think, is trying to abstract away a lot more of that complexity. Now, uh, this is a big change, and I'm gonna go into it, of course, into some more detail, but I, I just wanted to bring this up because there's this great video. That if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend you watch it. It's on YouTube. The title is down here at the bottom, uh, Brett Victor, The Future of Programming. It's, it's one of the most amazing uh, presentations I've ever seen. It was done in 2013, so it's 10 years old, but it's still, I think, highly relevant. You can see that he's dressed and he is actually presenting in 2013. He's talking about he's as if he was talking from the 70s, from 73. He's dressed as a developer from 73. You can actually see that he's got a pocket protector in. So he played the role of a developer predicting what computing would be like in 40 years, in 2013. Um, and one of the things he mentioned in this talk that really I think is relevant to, to this discussion is that he was talking about in the early days of programming, first the pro program programmers coded in binary and they got comfortable with that and they're quite happy with that. And then all, all of a sudden somebody came along and introduced assembly language, um, symbolic uh, optimized uh, assembly programming, I think is what that acronym SOAP stands for. Anyways, it's assembly language. And there was a lot of pushback because it was new, the people that were comfortable with binaries, like, why do I need this assembly language? Because I'm losing control. I have total control of the hardware at, at the, the binary level. So there was pushback. This is a version to change. And then we settled into assembly language after you know some whining and crying and, and finally started to get some adoption. 
but it didn't take too long before yet another wave of abstraction came along here, programming abstraction. And the one he shows here is Fortran. So Fortran comes along. Oh, you know, the assembly English program is all gone. Nah, what I don't, you know, I'm losing control. I can't, I don't, I'm not going to use that. I, you know, I, I can do whatever I want in the assembly language. His point is that um, there, there is this aversion as these new waves of abstraction are introduced. There's, we have to go through this change, and change is something that we resist and we often find to be painful. And I, I think. If you're here, if you're listening to this talk, you're probably not necessarily in that group, but I like the points that, that Mr. Victor made here because I use it for ammunition when I'm talking to other people. So maybe you could use this to talk when you're talking to other people when you're trying to convince them to try something new. So uh, what I wanna do is just jump quickly into, a, before I show you uh, like what this abstraction layer is, I just wanna show you an example of an app that I built using this abstraction layer. And it, it's an app I call Where on Earth. And the way it works is that I wrote it, I wrote the front end is just some JavaScript and then I wrote the back end in this this, this highly abstract uh, layer of that I'll, I'll show you some more details in, in a minute. But it's based on open street maps. I can um, you know zoom into a certain area of the world. And what I can do is uh, create simulated IoT devices. And uh, as I zoom in, you can see that there's these regions, there's these circular regions where there are devices that have been created. And um, you know, so I, what I, you know, so what happens here is that, um, let me pick another part of the, I'm just gonna pick kind of another area here and I'll just show you a quick example. So I, you can zoom in onto an area of the map. Uh, I'm just picking another city here. Um, and, I can create what's called a generator. And I pick a location, then I pick a radius, like this is the area that I wanna cre you know, create devices in. Then I can pick the number of devices I wanna create. And I'll write, make around say like 1500 or so. And then I can pick a rate and say like 500 per second. So it's gonna go pretty quick. So then I send in a request to the backend service, backend microservices that I'll show you what they are in a moment. And then this is triggering a whole, kind of event-driven type of sequence of events. And you can see the devices start to appear on the screen at, at the rate that the, uh, I asked for. So the devices are created. And then there's a kind of another process of aggregation that's occurring that takes a little bit more time where it's gonna be computing uh, where devices are, you know, how many devices are in a given region on the map. And you can see this starting to appear there here on the map as they're, as they're getting computed. But this aggregation is also happening through kind of an event-driven type of a process. And, um, you, and you can kind of see it all happening real time. This is the fun part of this application. This is a really fun application to write. Now, the, 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 the tricky part was that the, this aggregation has to happen at uh, 20 levels of zoom. It, you know, there's uh, like zoom level 19 is where devices are at and zoom zero is where it's at the, the whole world. So as I zoom out, you can see where you know, there's devices across the, the whole world. And this aggregation is happening now, you know, as, as uh, the, the computing is going on, you can see more and more of these aggregated regions are showing up. Anyways, this is the app. Could spend a whole hour just talking about this uh, this app. Now it's it's written in, in this case, it's written in Java. This this environment is polyglot, but I've, I've done it in Java. And it's using spring-like notation. So the API is quite simple. This is the generator microservice, as I call it. And this is the one that got the request to create a new generator with the, with the location, the radius, the number of devices to be created, and uh, the rate. So this generator then started emitting events, which trigger the actual process of creation and uh, I wish I had more time to explain how it works, but it, it's really pretty cool. But the point I want to make is that this is running in a highly abstract layer where it's even databaseless, and that you know, say this this command is coming into this microservice, and you can see that I'm just doing a getting an event for that. This is just a method I wrote for this command. So given the current state of this device, which in this case the device is brand new, so it has no state, the the create command comes in. And that's going to trigger uh, creating an event, 
which gets persisted by this return. So this effects dot emit events then reply is basically uh, handing back to the platform that this is running on. Here's an event that I would like you to persist and then process further down the line. So there's no database connections here. There's no database transactions here. There's no serialization or deserialization here, handling the incoming requests or sending back the response. Um, it's just, it, it's simplified. So this is the, the, the whole idea of this kind of coding here is that the, you know, the code is fairly simple here. The only complicated code here is kind of figuring out the, uh, the actual random location of devices using doing some latitude and, latitude and longitude type of, uh, of computations, but that's the business logic. But the integration with the, you know, the persistence layer, handling events and so on is all handled by the platform. Um, and the, the, the code is quite simple. So uh, this, I'll give you the link to this project, but um, it, it's pretty straightforward. Um, the, uh, the other thing is, I wanna move on here. So this is the actual kind of high level design of this application. They, you know, there, that, there was that client UI written in JavaScript that had that uh, open street map integration, you know, in the, in the JavaScript code. But basically what I did was when I created um, a generator was I, I captured all that data using the user interface and then sent a single request to uh, a, a generator microservice it's, uh, that uh, received the request to create an, a, a new generator. So that new generator gets created and it's emitting a, a, a quite a few events um, kind of on, uh, repeatedly where it's triggering the creation of um, devices. And these events that are coming out of the generator are triggering, uh, ulti ultimately result in sending individual messages to each of the 1500 or so devices that I just created. So a lot of eventing happened in the system where it was creating all these devices. And then as devices are getting created, they're emitting events, which are getting handled by another microservice I call region. And region is those, those rectangular areas on the map where it's aggregating the data. And the, the reason I have kind of this loopback event is that what's happening is that um, a device tells its region that it's within, hey, I'm here, I'm a new device, you need to aggregate, you need to add me to your account. That region then is at a certain zoom level and it, it then it, what it needs to do is propagate a higher level kind of aggregated event up to its parent region. And that propagates from 19, you know, zoom level 19 where the devices are at to 18 where the first you know, real physical region is at, and it goes all the way up to zero. So it, there's a venting that's just kind of propagating all the way up. This is the way I made this app work. You could do it differently, but the point is it was this is all just done to uh, event-driven types of um, integration. The client, it just sent in that single request, got a, you know, uh, to say create a generator, got a response back. Yep, the generator is created. And then what the client is doing is this pulling uh, views, these little Vs I, I represent as views. And I'll get into a little bit more detail on what, what all these symbols mean here. But this is basically how this app worked. It's a fun little event-driven type of application, highly scalable, um, highly distributed, runs in clusters, and all those types of things. I don't care about that as a developer. What I care about is the design and implementation of my application. And then I deploy it. I basically give my application to the, um, the platform and say platform run my application, which means it's gonna set up everything I need, like the, the, the databases that are underlying this application. Everything gets set up. That's all abstracted away from me. As a developer, I'm just kind of concerned about my code. Here's another example app. You can see there's also a link down to this GitHub repo for those that are interested. Um, and it's another event-driven type of an app. And uh, I'll get into a little bit more detail on this one as well. But before I get into it, I want to kind of explain um, some of the pieces of this, uh, this abstraction layer. So it's, it's quite simple. It starts out with projects. You, you define projects within this, um, you know, this abstraction layer. And projects, you can have any number of projects and you can use projects in whatever way you want. So some projects could be just for, for you, for development, or for your team, for doing you know, team development, 
or another project could be for uh, testing or performance testing or whatever you want to do. And then some projects are, of course, for production. Each project you can uh, control who has access to those things are highly secure, especially this is, of course, very important for production. But you have control over what you do with your project. You may, you, know, you manage the, the project within this environment. When it, within each project, there's just simple deployments. So they're, you know, um, they, they're called services, and but I'd like to call them deployments because that's really what they are, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, you can have any number of services, one or more services within a project, and uh, and these these services are are self-contained, independent of each other. I mean, they're, they're deployed independently, um, but they can uh, interact with each other, of course, as well. Um, and then within the deployments, there are three building block components. There is what's called an entity, but I think of these more as a, as, as a tight focused microservice. And then there's views with, with this V-shaped, and these are um, queryable views. And, and the reason what's going on here is entities are responsible for, like I said, they're microservices. They're responsible for handling commands or you know, requests to do some operation coming in. They perform some kind of a state change operation. And there's two flavors of, of, uh, of these. There's one that's event sourcing, where it, it emits events. And then another one is more CRUD-like, is like a key value thing, where it just emits the, the current state change to be persisted into a, a state store. But uh, I, I'm... I think there's, there's much more value and usage of the, uh, the eventing ones, the, the event sourcing ones. So if you're familiar with event sourcing, event sourcing, and then goes, typically what goes along with that or what event sourcing is typically part of is CQRS or command query responsibility segregation. And what that means is that entities or these microservices are only focused on writing data. They're not focused on reading data. Now you can retrieve in like individual things like the state of an individual IoT device or the state of an individual shopping cart or an order or something like that, whatever it happens to be your design. But the views are for reading. And this is the segregation piece. The writing happens in one place, reading happens in another place. They're separated from each other. So the views are there to take the data that's coming from the microservices and project those into queryable views. So this is the CQRS part, and that's built into this platform. So those, that's two of the three building block components within this platform. The third one is a real workhorse, and it's called an action, but it's a you can think of it as like a, a stateless, serverless function. But it, I it's I think it's that's almost kind of um, not giving it enough credit because you can do you do so much with these actions, but they're like the synaptic connection between uh, event flows, you know, uh, and, and I'll show you how that works in a minute. But these are the three building blocks. I'm amazed how much I can do with this as a developer. And it, I also like the fact that it kind of keeps me within uh, some guardrails as far as how I develop things because of the, the, the way these things work. Because it, you might think initially, again, um, uh, every time I have that aversion, oh, I can't use this. I've done this over and over and over in my career. And now I'm at the point, whenever that instinct kicks in, I know I need to polarize it to the opposite end, meaning that instead of just dismissing this because it's like, oh man, I can't use this. I, I need all the flexibility. It's like, no, 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 Hugh, you're wrong. <laughs> your, your instincts are wrong. You go with it, and uh, so I'm now. I'm just like I, I gotta check it. You know, when I hear something new, instead of dis immediately dismissing it, I typically try and uh, check it out before I just outright dismiss it. And I think in this case, the payoff's pretty high because I was I've been talking about it as a as a developer advocate, and I speak at conferences all over the world, and I've been doing it for for some years now. And I've been one of the things I've been talking about for a long time is microservice systems. And one of the things I've been talking about with microservices is the microservices should be focused. You know, each microservice should do one thing and do it well. Each microservice should own its own data and not expose that data to anything outside of the microservice other than through its API. Each microservice should be loosely coupled. And now I finally feel like I've got a tool that formalizes a lot of these practices 
it makes it hard for developers not to do some of the things that all, many of us have been trying to evangelize to the development community. And of, of course, is being adopted by some of the development community, but the microservice environment over the last, you know, almost a decade now has been pretty wild and wooly. And it's, you know, it's, it's loose, I think, in many cases, how, how we've been doing things. But we've been trying to say, you know, tight focus, own your data, loosely coupled, all that good stuff. And here that this is exactly how this system works. So in the, in the case of this order processing demo, I just want to walk through the eventing very quickly. So you got a client that's, you know, interacting with a shopping cart. You know, I got a shopping cart, you got a shopping cart, other users that are currently active on the system right now, each one of us has our own shopping cart. It's a unit of state that's being managed by the backend system. We're sending in commands from the client you know, via requests to shopping cart, add an item, change an item, remove an item, whatever. We're building up to our, uh, each, each of our shopping carts. Hopefully, from the perspective of the business that's running this, you know, this online shopping site, people hit the buy button and they, they check out the order. When orders are checked out, that microservice, that shopping cart microservice emits an event that's picked up by an action you know, those, that stateless um, serverless function, which tr translates that event, you know, uh, shopping cart created, say, event, and it creates, it transforms that into a create order command and uh, fires that command off at, uh, at the order microservice. And now an order is created. Now, the, the client sent in that single request and the response back went to the client, yep, yep, your order's checked out, we're working on it. So the client's gone at this point, but this one single event, this checkout event is, is going to trigger a pretty elaborate a cascading sequence of events here that, that, that's kind of cool. So the order gets created. When it gets created, it emits an event that's actually being picked up by two different actions. And one is an order item, which is just kind of there for query, so it's not really important. But the, another one is a shipping order. So the difference between at least this is my design don't have to be doesn't have to be done this way i know this isn't a real system but it's a, it was a fun demo to do is more than just a simple shopping cart demo which i was getting sick and tired of, of, of doing just that i wanted to do something more real like allocate stock to an order so that's what this is working towards so the shipping order is trying is responsible for getting stock allocated to the order the order tracks the order through um is full life cycle. That's what these two different you know, order does and, and shipping order does. So when order gets created, it emits an event to create, it causes the creation of a, of a shipping order. When a shipping order gets created, it creates an event that actually um, explodes out into creating multiple order SKU items for all these items in, in the uh, shopping cart in the order. And when each of those individual order SKU items gets created, guess what? They emit an event, which gets picked up by uh, stock. But in this case, the action is doing a little bit more interesting work. Instead of just transforming an event into a command, what it first does is a query against a stock view. And what it's looking for is stock that's available. It gets that response back from the query. And if there is stock available, then it will create a command to send to, say, allocate stock you know, uh, to a particular order, allocate a particular unit of stock to a particular uh, order unit of stock. If there isn't sufficient stock available for that SKU, this action, I don't have it, uh, an arrow showing it, but it would actually send a command back to that order SKU item, say, hey, put yourself in a back order state because we don't have sufficient stock right now. So there's a bit of a saga-like pattern going on here. Again, a lot of detail here that I we just don't have a lot of your time to, to cover here, but um, it goes through the processing. So all this eventing occurs, you know, that that ultimately ends up notifying the order that, uh, you know, either all the stock has been allocated and the order is ready to ship, or some of it's or some or all of it's on in a, in a back order state. That type of thing, all done through eventing. Um, the all the eventing is being managed by the platform. All the messaging, all the you know, for for me, for you as a developer, we're just writing the uh, the the microservices, we're writing the, the code for that, we're writing the code for the views, we're writing the code for the actions, that's it. Um, events are being passed to actions by the platform. I, you don't have to explicitly write code to retrieve events from the 
you know, the event journal, say, from the upstream thing that you want, you just declare in your code through an annotation in Java that, you know, my, my event source is from, uh, like in shipping, that shipping order action, you know, the order to shipping order action, it just declares through an annotation saying, hey, my, my event source is order, you know, give me events from there. That's all, I, all you have to do. It, it's a kind of a declarative type of thing. So back on the, that we're on earth, I just wanted to show you a little bit more detail and I'll go through this quickly because we're running out of time. But this is a, a kind of a, a more detailed breakdown of the uh, processing that happens. At, at the demo, I, I call it uh, we're on earth, uh, W-O-E. So the idea is that, you know, the client said to generate, um, you know, create a generator. The generator gets created and emits an event that those uh, that event gets picked up and you know, propagated into a view. But also gets picked up by some actions. You can see one action is actually going back to the generator. So there's kind of a loopback that's occurring here. And what's happening here is this loopback is just telling the generator, all right, you, you generated some of the devices that are needed per unit of time. Here's your next unit of time. You know, generate the next quantity of devices based on that kind of like the current time. So it's just kind of a loopback that keeps triggering the, the generator to keep generating stuff until it's done. And then that loop setback cycle will happen. Conversely, what's happening is that the generator is generating events that ultimately re re result in an action sending commands to individual devices, like the 1500 devices I created. There were 1500 commands that were sent out to create all those devices. And that just kind of loops around until all the uh, devices are created. Uh, as devices are created, they emit events that are getting picked up and it goes to a region. Uh, the, the region emits an event that kind of uh, keeps looping back and um, you know, to go up the different zoom levels, up the stack of zoom levels that were, that were in the map to do that aggregation of all the data that's arriving. There's some dampening that occurs so that the, you know, the zoom level zero isn't getting like 1500 mess, you know, commands. It's, it's getting far less than that because it's kind of like uh, what happens is in this aggregation flow that occurs through this eventing, there's kind of a, a flood of events that are coming in at the lowest level zooms, but then it's, it kind of gets down to a trickle as it gets to the, you know, like to, to the top level um, region for the entire world. And then the client is just querying the views. So all the data that we're, look, that we're looking at on the map is coming from the views that were ultimately updated from, as a result of all, the, of, of all this eventing that occurred. So that loops around for a bit, and um, you know we're uh, we're done. Um, another app, and I'm actually working on this one right now. It, it, I've got the design worked out, and it's actually kind of my second iteration on the design uh, uh, and implementation cycle. I'm, I'm re-implementing it uh, with this kind of new design. It's a simplification of my prior design, but the fun part is that I really enjoy as a developer. And as a say an architect or a designer is thinking through the eventing process here. And what one of the interesting mechanical aspects of this that you have to consider is that all of the eventing, all of the messaging that occurs here is a guaranteed at least once delivery, which is great. That means that every single event that I want to trigger an action to perform some kind of operation to send a command downstream to another microservice, I know will happen. It'll, at some point it will happen. It might not happen immediately. It might happen with, you know, very, very quickly. It typically does within milliseconds, but it could not happen until tomorrow if there was an outage or something, or seconds later if something slowed or if the, or if the network burped or something like that. But all these messages are guaranteed to be delivered because this is at least one delivery. That's typically what you get with you know, any kind of um, you know, message broker. But that also comes with a consideration of item potency. And item potency is that each of the receivers of in these incoming messages have to be able to handle getting the same message more than once. And that will give you pause as you're considering the design. It will. I, I will guarantee you, because I've been dealing with this for a year now myself, um, kind of heads down all the time, is working through designs where you have have this at least once message guarantee, delivery 
guaranteed, which is great, but you've got to build your services to be item potent. That's a new thing. Typically, we haven't had to deal with that as developers. But it, when you do it, it's a thing of beauty because you've got, you end up having a robust, robust system. Anything can break here. Any part of this flow that's occurring here. In this case, what this application is doing is what it's designed for is this topic that is consuming messages from that are flowing into this transaction microservice is high volume. It's like thousands of messages are coming off of a Kafka topic per second. The system has to be able to consume all those uh, messages and aggregate that data into what are called merchant payments. So the what's happening here is that there's a there's a flood of data coming in, you know, every second into the system, and it's stepping down kind of like what I did with the zoom levels in the region. This this um, microservice I call interval is handling data at time intervals. So initially it handles data at a subsecond interval and subsecond intervals feed into second intervals and second intervals feed into minute intervals and minute intervals to hour and hour to day. And then day intervals, their events are being watched for in this action right before the merchant. And the, it's feeding as the days are getting updated with merchant specific uh, aggregated data, you know, sums of, of uh, transaction activity that need to be uh, uh, sent out as payments to the merchant or merchant uh, payments that the merchant has to make to other entities uh, for service charges and things like that. Um, that flow is quite low at the day end because it's been kind of stepped down through the, through a series of aggregation. But this is money, right? So no data can be lost. Nothing can get corrupted. And it was very important to consider things like item potency in a system like this. But this system, what happened, what's happening then is the merchants emitting events as days are getting updated, and those those days are just going to uh, payments, the current payment for the current payment cycle. And we're just aggregating continuously in real time. And whenever uh, payments have a certain time cycle, it could be hours, it could be days, it could be weeks, it could be more, whatever, you know, whatever the, um, the receiver of the payments want them to be. But when the, the payment cycle is done, we just shut off the flow to one payment. The, the merchant does this from one payment and the flow immediately switches over to another uh, payment. So there's no, uh, the system is a, uh, um, often done in, in, a, in a batch way where when you want a payment, you trigger a whole batch kind of activity where you're trying to accumulate a lot of the data that's been, then that has been come, has come in over time and you want to do it as quickly as possible to, to uh, bring out a payment. This system does it in real time. Again, it's rock solid because of the least ones delivery and being very careful to divine, design the services to be item potent. So this is an example of, of this new abstraction layer. Um, again, I wish I had more time, but the, the, you know, the, the main thing is, is like it's trying to cut out as much complexity as possible and leave us with uh, the really important stuff, which is design of these applications, which is a really fun intellectual uh, challenge to and and one that's great when you're you you're not uh, distracted with all the other technologies things that we historically have had to deal with. I I feel liberated honestly when I'm working on this. Uh, I tell people I don't want to go back to the old ways of doing things. I love Kubernetes. I it was a it's a great invention. But I don't want to go back and start dealing with YAML files again. I, you know, I'm sick and tired of coding uh, configurations in YAML files. In this system, there's zero configuration. My configuration is defined in my code. How I wired things together, how I wired these services together, is basically uh, defined in code, and that's it. I'm done. Um, the another thing, just I, again, I, you can tell I'm a big fan of this talk. But early on in this talk. Um, uh, Brett made two uh, made a, a really interesting point. He said it's easy to adopt new technologies, but it being hard to adopt new ways of thinking. And he ha hammers on this. And I just noticed this, but if you look at this picture, he's got that pocket protector, and he's got this one uh, pencil sticking up. I don't know if he's giving us a salute or not because he he's I think he's um, 
admonishing the audience for why is it in 2013 and now in 2023, we aren't doing some of the things that he talked about. It's a really interesting talk. And that's the kind of the point I'm trying to make here is that we're moving into an era where there's more solutions coming out that's abstracting away complexity and giving us these new uh, kinds of platforms. So what I've been talking about in this particular case is it's called Calyx. You can look it up at calyx.io. Uh, but I also I think I've also hopefully covered things in a somewhat generic way in, you know, in like generic about microservices, generic about uh, adventure and types of systems and about platforms that are coming. So it's it's not that we're getting rid of Kubernetes, but by far this platform that I'm talking about, Calyx, is built on top of Kubernetes, but it's Kubernetes less from the perspective of people using it. It's database less, it's broker less. All those things are there, but they're abstracted away. And they're I, I think they're abstracted away quite nicely. And I'm really excited about you know our future, you know, as more and more solutions like this come out. So thank you. And um, I think we're ready for some questions if there are any. Doesn't look like there's any questions right now. Um, you got my Twitter handle down here at McKee H3. If you if you do have any questions, I'd be happy to uh, you know try and hand, handle those, um, especially if you have people watching the recording. So I guess if we don't have any questions. I'll turn it back over to you, Candice. Thank you so much, Hugh, and thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day. Oh, you know, actually, Hugh, we, it looks like we got, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold off on, on sending everyone away. It looks like we might have gotten some Q&A. Oh, yeah, we do. Oh, okay. yeah, oh. we got a bunch. So, yeah, we nice. will hang out and then we will like end in about, you know, you can get through these and once you're done, we can wrap up. So the first question is, uh, have you plans to add support for Apache Mesos? Um, not that I know of. Um, of course, this system has to be able to integrate with things that are outside of this environment. And, um, and the two primary ways to do that is either through, you know, uh, through message buses like Kafka or, or uh, Google Pub Sub or something like that. Uh, and then through the APIs, you know, either uh, external systems reaching into this, you know, into applications you built here with via the APIs provided by the services you build in this platform, or this, you know, actions within this platform you know, in your application reaching out to external services. But no, the 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 um, the underlying I I deliberately didn't say what is inside the box, you know, this this Calyx box, uh, other than you know things like yeah, Kubernetes is there. And there is a database and um, you know things like that, but uh, uh, it's it's pretty technology agnostic. Um, the next question is: Do you think Calyx concepts are universally agreed upon? Excellent question. Thank you. I I think yes, and I did. I, I kind of touched on that in in that, um, especially in building event driven microservice systems. The, the the concepts are grounded in those things. We and like I said, you know that microservices. We've been trying to uh, evangelize the concept of microservices should be tight, focused, own their data, loosely coupled, and uh, the, one of the best ways to loosely couple microservices is to do eventing because one service emits events. You know, it's, it's fire and forget. They the 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 producer of messages does not care who the consumers are. The consumers of messages does not care who the producers are. That's loosely coupled. So the concepts I think are heavily grounded in, in where, and, and another thing I just real quickly is I'm, I'm seeing, especially in people that I talk to out in you know, all over the world, they are kind of going through a generational shift and people that have built some microservice systems that weren't following some of these principles and now event-driven, for example, is becoming much more popular. 
Oh, uh, let's see. That looks like it for the questions. Thank you for the, um, I'm, I'm glad pe some people enjoyed it. Um, give it a try. There's a free trial. You can try it out. We've, you know, I've got my examples that I've been trying to push out there. Um, it, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, you get, try for free. It, you know, you can do it on an individual basis. Um, it's rocked my world as a developer. <laughs> I'll say that. Um, oh, here's some more questions. Um, Oh, this is a good question. Uh, let's see. We just, yeah, we got a few more minutes. Um, how is this different from Dapper? Excellent question. Uh, Dapper is a, a distributed application platform, I think is what it stands for. It's from microservices. It's, it's a really cool solution. Definitely worth taking a look at because I, I consider it to be similar in some respects to Calyx. The big difference is that what Dapper does is it, it straps away things at the code level but it allows you to configure in at the level below this code abstraction layer that's provided by Dapper into specific services. So you are involved in configuring in the services and you are also responsible for running all those services or somebody is. The, with Calyx, that, there's that hard layer. That, you know, you, we, Calyx is a platform as a service. We provide the platform. We manage the platform for you. We run it. There's nothing to configure. You know, the, the services that are within Calyx are, are defined. Dapper gives you the, the, the flexibility to, to do something, uh, you know, do it the way you want to do it. So it, but it is, I think they're they're similar in a lot of ways in, in spirit. And uh, let's see, I think we got a little bit more time. Uh, is there any plans for it? a community-based version, it is a platform as a service. It's kind of like uh, you know Amazon serverless on steroids. And if you look at some of the other talks and other material that we have, we've kind of talked about how we're, um, we're in spirit uh, similar to serverless, but beyond that in, in a way that because we're, uh, we're, we're, not, we're, we're not just you know, say abstracting away, say the, the functionality, but we're abstracting away the data layers and the messaging layers and things like that, um, but you know, in both cases, you, you're you're running this on a platform that you that you pay for. Um, it 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 does run in a um, in a uh, dedicated environment. You can have a dedicated environment running in Amazon or Google right now. Microsoft coming uh, later uh, later this year, uh, and um, but no no plans for a community version. And then let's see, we've got one more. Yeah, con uh, somebody wanted to contact, contact, like I said, through, um, through initially contact through um, Twitter would be great. Um, and I think we're out of time. So, let, no, I guess, let me finish this one. Let me finish this one. Yes, yeah, sorry. I'm trying to understand this last question that's here is. Um, I couldn't find just Stanislaus's question in your Apple Music library. You can ask me to play a radio station or ask for music in a different app. I th okay, the last one I wanted to cover is, is it about how much percent it increases the developer development time? And it is, but in the, it's not increase, it's decrease. The um, the developer, I think, and I'm speaking as from my experience as a developer writing code on this system, and, a, and a, uh, I've been writing code for decades uh, on many different platforms, all usually back end, all mo um, mostly Java. So that's kind of my background back, you know, back in enterprise systems. Um, it decreases the time that I, that I know I've spent on development because I'm eliminating the time that I spent on non-development activities like configuring in uh, services, like understanding how to do, you know, learning how to do new things like Kubernetes and uh, Kafka and, and all these other things. I've, I've done that 
but that, you know, when, you, when you're new to that, you, of course, you have to invest the time to do that, then invest the time to uh, typically have some involvement in setting it up, you know, you know somebody, that, somebody somewhere has to do this, and often it falls onto the development team. The thing I like about this is that now, like I was saying earlier, that I'm totally focused on the design and implementation of this. It's like trying to uh, really reduce the friction from the initial thoughts of design and the initial lines of code all the way into production. Make that pro that entire process much um, more frictionless. That's the way uh, I, I view this. So, and all focused on really features that matter to the business, features that matter to your users, not all the other tasks that we typically have to deal with in these highly complex environments that we run around back in applications. And... All right, with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Candice. I think um, uh, we've uh, used up enough time of everybody here. Awesome. Thank you so much, Hugh, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. A reminder that this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars and have a wonderful day.